second talk uh, I have given here about Saratoga Springs, and uh, at the risk of duplication, I'll go into uh, some of the matters that I uh, talked about a month ago. The title of the talk tonight is Taking the Waters, Saratoga Springs in the Mid-19th Century. And I, I want you for a moment, if you will, to think about the Hamptons right now. Who goes to the Hamptons? What function do the Hamptons play in, in the regional society and really in national society too? And if you think about that, you are already thinking about Saratoga Springs in the middle five decades of the 19th century as well as thereafter. A bit of history about Saratoga. Sar the springs, when we talk about the springs in Saratoga, we are talking about the mineral springs, the mineral springs that you drink. Uh, if you go in the grocery store today, you can actually still buy Saratoga water in little blue bottles. I will tell you that that, that, that liquor is deracinated. It tastes nothing like what you, you can actually drink this stuff. Uh, you can make a cocktail out of it, but it tastes nothing like what still comes out of the ground in downtown Saratoga. And Congress, Congress Spring is there, Haythorn Spring is there, they're uh, in the middle of beautiful parks and pavilions, and you can push the button and you can take a taste, but I, I implore you not to swallow. You won't swallow. It's absolutely sulfurous. It's the same water that when you go to the Mineral Spring Pavilion in the uh, New York State Park facility that's on the west end of town there, you bathe in this. and You might as well be drinking or bathing in or from the Dead Sea. I mean, it is that vile. So this was Saratoga. It was thought to be good for you. It was thought to be good for you. So to take the waters in Saratoga in the mid-19th century did not mean to bathe in them. Bathing in Saratoga in the mid-19th century was not the purpose. You went there to actually imbibe these things. It's, it's like, uh, it's as if you were in Bath. Has anybody here been to Bath, England? Been to Bath? So Saratoga Springs in, in the spring houses aped Bath. Bath in the early 18th century was the, the uh, neck to ultra of social uh, uh, gathering places in, uh, in 18th century England. And you went there to take the waters. There's a central pavilion, there's an attendant in the middle. You got dressed up, especially in the morning, took, went down there and you, sh uh, you, shared, you shared glasses with your neighbors there. After you were done taking the waters, you went back to your hotel or to your boarding house, you changed for one of four or five changes of clothing, and then you did something for the rest of the morning. You went into the dining room for lunch, you went out on an afternoon excursion, etc. So taking the waters was extremely important in Saratoga. Saratoga's history, though, dates back to really the late 18th century. Native Americans introduced British soldiers to the springs in 1767 and gradually the springs were named. There was Congress, Columbia. Columbia was opened by Gideon Putnam. Again, if you've been to Saratoga, the Gideon Putnam Hotel is, is there, uh, built in the uh, early, uh, early 20th century. It's a wonderful place to stay. Putnam was the, uh, really, I guess the Donald Trump perish the thought of Saratoga Springs in the early 19th century. He built everything. Things were named after him. He named Columbian Spring. And when you, when you developed a spring in Saratoga, in the, when you developed one in the early 19th century, you tubed it. You drove a lead, again, perish the thought, a lead pipe into the ground. And the spring was tubed so it could come up in an organized and pressure-driven fashion. And then many of the springs were topped by Grecian domes, by toluses, or by little temples, you know, and, and people put on the door. There was Hamilton Spring. Putnam Spring, etc. Hotels gradually developed in Saratoga Springs in the early 19th century, but the customers were mostly upper middle class and even upper class individuals because the trip to Saratoga from New York City was arduous. There was no railroad service to Saratoga Springs of any sort of connected nature until 1853. You took a steamboat up the river, you took a horse and carriage, many, many, many hours inland. You didn't go for the weekend. You went for several weeks, and thus only people with some money could leave their jobs. Trust fund people, whatever, nouveau riche also, but wealthy people 
wealthy people went to Saratoga Springs to spend the entire summer when Cornelius Vanderbilt connected the New York and Hudson Railroad with some of with the Albany and Saratoga Railroad, you could make it to Saratoga Springs in only eight hours with only one change of train. And thus, for the weekend, for three days or four days, middle-class people could descend on Saratoga. And that's when Saratoga came to resemble what the Hamptons in some ways resemble today. You don't just have Christy Brinkley and Billy Joel. I don't know any new names, so forgive me if you will. But you don't just have celebrities. You don't just have celebrities. Every wannabe who's of this ilk runs out to the Hamptons for the weekend. You take the jitney. People took the train to Saratoga, and they stayed in hotels. By 1855, there were 20,000 hotel rooms in Saratoga Springs, innumerable boarding houses, and no more arduous trip. Saratoga Springs was known as another th for another thing, though, that uh, the Hamptons are known for. It was really the club med of, of uh, the New York region. People came to Saratoga from all over the world, but Saratoga catered I'm going to say primarily to single people or to people who were pretending to be single for the time that they were there. And they would go up there and, you know, wine and dine and chase each other and, and meet. And particularly after the Civil War, immediately after the Civil War, there were so many widows, so many tens and tens of thousands of widows. Saratoga Springs was the place to go to try to find a new husband. And I'm going to pass around my favorite cartoon from 1865 from Leslie's Illustrated Weekly. Frank Leslie was an engraver. Uh, he worked in Saratoga Springs and all over the northeast. In 1857, I believe, founded Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper. It made vicious fun of social trends. And here you have Mrs. Dibbs. Mrs. Dibbs has arrived with her trunks and her little shin uh, at the depot, at the Grand Union Depot in Saratoga, and she's on the prowl. And what happened, what happened, uh, she's really quite, cuts quite a striking figure. She's a lady of a certain age. She's lost her husband, and some clearly he was a wounded veteran or whatever. She, she's without a man at this point. And what happened when you arrived in Saratoga, male or female at the depot, you were swarmed by hustlers. You were swarmed. Legions of men, steerers, you would call them, descended on you when you got off the train. You know, there was no uh, Travelocity, no Expedia, uh, no, there was no Airbnb in 1865, and people didn't book ahead in general. I mean, and these steers would grab you and tell you they've got the best place to go, and, and, and you might end up in a miserable boarding house that was touted as having, you know, au cuisine, and etc., and, and you found a place to stay. Not only were hotels constructed in Saratoga during the mid-century, uh, before the right before the Civil War and during the Civil War, the race course that existed this day was built in 1863. Saratoga became a major thoroughbred running ground, and it still is to this day. The ballet is a later thing, the dance is a later thing, but there was an opera house given at Saratoga, and grand balls were a major attraction of the hotels. And if you can pass this around, I have several, several of these. You see these men and women. They were held in great hotel ballrooms. And uh, you, you carried around, women carried around on their, I think, on their left, uh, on their left uh, uh, wrist, they carried around a dance card. Now, when I was a teenager in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, we had cotillion, and I was a cotillion member. And all the girls had these little things. This is an actual dance card from 1855 from the Congress Hall Hotel, and uh, it actually found it in the uh, archives of Skidmore College when I was doing the research for a butchery on Bond Street. I won't go into the details of this. I'll be speaking about it uh, in in the fall, late in the fall here at the merchant's house. But suffice it to say that this fellow who was found dead, murdered, strangled, garroted, etc., who richly deserved to die, a misogynist, a gambler, just a, a hideous person, uh, his accused murderess was his ex-lover, and they uh, had a, an encounter, let us just say. They stayed in 
different rooms, at least some of the time, at the Congress Hotel, Paul Hotel in 1855. It's documented in the papers. And Emma Cunningham undoubtedly attended one of the balls. It's not unlikely she wore this precise dance card. And you signed up. You know, the men would come around and they would, you know, may I have a dance? And you could have the shotish or the, the polka or the, you know, galliard or whatever. And dancing was a very, very, very big deal. The rooms were very modest. If you go down to Cape May, New Jersey, there's still one old rambling wooden structure down there with teeny tiny rooms with uh, what looked like saloon doors. Uh, uh, as the bedroom doors. Now, now in Cape May, there are actual doors that you can close and lock, and the hotel I'm thinking of, his name escapes me right now, I think actually has air conditioning now, but back in 1855, no air conditioning, and your room was open. This was the only way you would choke to death at night. But the rooms were very tiny. You spent no time in your room. You spent time in public in Saratoga. You were there to see and be seen and, and pick people up, basically. I'm going to read you a little excerpt, a tiny little excerpt from Butchery on Bond Street. It'll give you a, and this will give you a, a, a taste of, uh, of what went on at Saratoga. Saratoga Springs was the premier East Coast hunting ground for widows like Emma Cunningham through much of the 19th century. Few resorts, though, rivaled Saratoga in its density of male seducers and swindlers stalking their victims through the crowded summertime streets. Caricatures of these men and their prey served as grist for many a contemporary sketch in Frank Leslie's Illustrated News, as well as in far less dignified journals. Sharp-nosed predators lost no time when a train alarm arrived. Porters unloading trunks packed with finery at the railroad station were shadowed right to the lobbies of their clients' hostelries. Women with wealth to trade for sexual companionship were much sought after by visiting Lotharios, whether or not youth and beauty formed part of the romance. So you can imagine what went on there. It's, it's, it's just like the Hamptons. It's exactly like it. These, these, these hotels all had enormous verandas. I mean, if you were between uh, activities and you change from your morning wear into your afternoon wear, that's what you did. You went out there and you paraded. The women particularly paraded on the verandas where they stayed up on the balconies of their hotels and uh, tried to attract appropriate attention. Here you have uh, some women lounging around on a balcony in dresses that are just, uh, they're, they're incomparable. And, uh, you know, people would come along and try to, try to get their attention. So like those in one in New Orleans today in a rather different fashion on Bourbon Street. Everybody who was anybody came to Saratoga Springs. Among the people who, who set up shop there, if you will, was a man named the Reverend Luther Beecher. Luther Beecher was second cousin to Henry Ward Beecher. Unlike Henry Ward Beecher, Luther was a Baptist, not a Congregationalist. He was the, uh, the pastor of the First Baptist Church. If you go to Saratoga today, you can still see the First Baptist Church. It's been run down. I don't think church going is not a major activity in Saratoga Springs as far as I know. But here's the church. Here's the church right here. It's a very plain Baptist type structure. It's plain inside. And this other image is of what had been Skidmore College's original uh, classroom building. This building still stands also. When Skidmore moved out to the northern end of town in the 1960s, uh, that building was turned into uh, senior citizen housing. It's still occupied as such. But before Skidmore acquired it, it had a different function. The Reverend Luther Beecher opened and operated something called the Temple Grove Female Seminary there. This was a ladies, a young women's finishing school. And, uh, and it's, it's really quite surprising what the curriculum was. You think of, uh, you think of uh, girls finishing schools in the mid-19th century as places to learn dancing and a bit of elocution, perhaps, and some French or whatever. But I have the catalog of the Temple Road Female Academy, and it's really quite extensive. There's geometry, there's classics, everything. I mean, it, it really reminds me of what Henry Packer did in downtown Brooklyn 
the 1850s, Packer Collegiate was founded and stayed a school for young women until well into the 20th century. It was uh, uh, K through 12, all women, and Packer was a very um, liberal and progressive man and thought that women, young women should have a real education and for all of his other thoughts and, and fanaticisms, Luther Beecher believed the same. At the Temple Grove Female Seminary, Emma Cunningham's daughter was shipped up there at Mr. Burdell's expense for a short period to get her away from the evil influences of Bond Street at the time, and perhaps so she could not witness her mother's ongoing, let's just call it, interaction with Dr. Burdell. But up she went to Temple Grove for a semester until Dr. Burdell stopped paying the tuition. Another very, very notable uh, summertime uh, resident in Saratoga Springs was Madame Eliza Jumel. Has anybody been to the Jumel Mansion? Well, you must. <coughs> Eliza Jumel is reputed to have been the daughter of a Providence uh, uh, Rhode Island prostitute. Somehow she ended up in New York in the uh, early 19th century. She married Stephen Jumel. Jumel, who was a uh, French wine merchant, a wealthy man. Unfortunately, Mr. Jumel died in the 1820s, left Eliza a very, very wealthy widow. But Eliza, she was so wealthy, she didn't need to go to Saratoga. She got whoever she wanted, okay? She made a very bad choice, though. She made a very bad choice. She married a fellow named Aaron Burr. Oh. Aaron Burr, she married him in 1832. He had already been disgraced for decades. He was a lawyer with no practice. Of course he took her hand. They were divorced a year later. Uh, she threw him out. The divorce papers are on display at the mansion. He died the same day the decree became final. And Madame Jumel, this is 1833, Madame Jumel uh, uh, tried to establish herself in Saratoga Springs. Nobody would rent her a property in Saratoga Springs. Nobody. She was disgraceful as far as other people were concerned. So she bought a piece of property in the middle of town, put up a spike house mansion, which is there to this day. It's a lovely house. And she had the temerity, uh, no, not the temerity, she had the chutzpah, if you'll pardon, pardon my speaking French. She had the chutzpah to drive around town in a coach and four with no footmen, no servants. She whipped the horses herself and challenged these men on the street to race her around the square. It's all documented in contemporary literature. And, and uh, you know, she, she lived out her days both in Saratoga and at the mansion uptown. You really must, must, must visit this place. I've been there. I take everybody there. So some people like she were there. there are, I, I don't have much more time, so I'll just tell you a little bit more about the uh, mise-en-scene in Saratoga. You have all of these, um, they may have had some money in their pocket, these middle-class men there come up for a few days. Uh, they may have had some money in their pocket, but they were not well-educated. Many of them were illiterate. Okay, you put on the door, you came, and you, you, you pretended you were somebody, you would meet a lady at the spring house, a so-called lady. You would meet a lady on a veranda or whatever, but you don't ask them face to face for a date. You know, you have to communicate with them. Uh, maybe you have a carte de visite with you, a little calling card, but you have to send them some correspondence. You know, make yourself in, uh, uh, known, introduced. There were letter writers, professional letter writers, sitting all around the public parks there, and you would go up to them and you'd give them the lady's hotel address, and they would sit there and pin something out for you, for you to hand deliver to the uh, to the desk of the hotel. Um, I talked about the steerers, and, and this is how this is how uh, social commerce transpired in Saratoga. Saratoga kind of went down, not kind of, it very much went downhill during the late 19th century. It's always about the newest and the best and the brightest. And as transportation improved in this country, as long distance railroad improved, as Florida got developed, as other uh, elite, uh, so-called elite areas developed, Saratoga went downhill. A casino was built in the late 19th century. Gambling was very popular, but Saratoga, uh, Saratoga became very, very déclassé by World War One, and it slid, and it slid, and it slid, really until after the Second World War. 
only with the revival of the racing seasons there, courtesy our, our, our grace to, to uh, Joan A. Whitney, only courtesy of the ballet that's been there for how many decades now. Saratoga's experienced somewhat of a revival, but those of you who have not been there, if you go there, uh, the accommodation choices of the McGee and Putnam amount to uh, uh, Hotel Six, and there's a bikers convention there every summer. Every summer, the, the, the Spring Pavilion is wonderful. It's on the edge of town, but it, it's not a dangerous place. But it, I, I visited there for the research of this book in the winter. And it's shut tight in the winter. It's really it's it's still an opportunity. It's a wonderful place to visit that's not overwhelmed. I mean, East Hampton has its lovely spots, and South Hampton has its lovely spots, but you're, you're hemmed in when you go to these places in the summer. I, I, I never, never go. And Saratoga's a real opportunity. The historical society there is marvelous. It's housed in the old casino structure. The library is spectacular. And if you take an interest in something Saratoga, you can go there and just immerse yourself for a couple of days. I really recommend Fall. The bikers aren't there, and uh, or very few of them, and it's, it's really a marvelous place to visit. Um, I would like to entertain any questions. Yes. Um, specifically, what what was the what led people to start going there? What was the belief about the orders that you said they take? Medicinal. What led people to go to Saratoga? What was the interest in the waters? Medicinal. I mean, in the early 19th century, there was just there were just as many health fads all over the world as there are today. And drinking these waters, I mean, that's a European tradition. It didn't start in Saratoga, but America aped European traditions. We aped them. Pleasure gardens <coughs> such as William Nimrod's aped Ronley, aped Vauxhall in, in, in London. Pleasure gardens were a late 17th century phenomenon in London, and by by the mid 19th century, although pleasure gardens were still going strong in America, property values had increased so much in central London that pleasure gardens had virtually disappeared. Medicinal fads, not only drinking waters but hydropathy, bathing in waters, was deemed to be very good for your your corpus, if you will. And this was, you know, people have been going to Baden Baden and Bad Karlsbad and all over Western Europe for since time in memorial. Well, in America, not so. Not until the 1830s, 1840s. And then I, there were hydropathy clinics right here. There was one in Manhattan. And there were, there were crackpot things, okay. There was nothing wrong with taking a bath. But if you, there was a, 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 a nexus of hydropathy, uh, Grahamites. We all eat graham crackers, graham flour. You know, what, you know who Graham was? Mr. Sylvester Graham uh, believed that Graham flour was good for you. He developed this sort of, uh, I don't know what it's, it's, it's a kind of flour. It's milled a certain way. It's not sweet like the crackers. They add sugar. But there were Grahamites. And the center of the Grahamite movement was right here on Bond Street at 47 Bond Street. There was a group of anti-tobacconists, free love advocates, and hydropathy people. The waters, whether you drank them or you bathed in them, it's all part of this phenomenon. It was sort of like a, the Amway of the day. Thank you, thank you to the Merchant's House, and thank you for listening to me.